Next house, cancer in this house. A man and a woman lived here by the name of Voss, Jack Voss. He died with cancer. Uh, she had a deformed child, and she drowned the child in the bathtub, and then she committed suicide that same day. We are the spark in the engine. The switch in the night. A voice in the dark from a million miles away. Down the road farther, the next household, uh, the father died of cancer, the mother has leukemia right and now, and the daughter has thyroid cancer and takes thyroid medication. We go hand in hand, you and me. We are threads in the invisible tapestry. People helping people. And GE is part of everything we do. Somebody somewhere sat down and said, let's keep lying to them and keep saying it over and over and they'll believe it. And we did. And some people still do. This is the story of a product that General Electric manufactures, but doesn't advertise to the public. And of the people who are working to change the deadliest business of all, the nuclear weapons industry. When I was in high school, I was able to be, participate in many, many different, you know, school activities. So I was just, you know, going 24 hours a day, as most young people do. And then it was when um, I was at Whitman College that I came home for Christmas and my parents noticed something was drastically wrong with me. And they took me to a physician. The physician said that I had the most severe case of hypothyroidism he'd ever seen in his career. And it was a minus 36, the basal metabolic rate. So he said, you know, you're acting as if you're about 90 years old instead of 19. The college June Casey was attending was located in Walla Walla, Washington. 50 miles downwind from the Hanford Nuclear Reservation, a massive 570 square mile facility where General Electric made plutonium for the U.S. military between 1946 and 1965. And then I began losing my hair, which um, I had long, naturally curly hair, and then had to start wearing a wig and have since um, lost two babies through a miscarriage and a stillbirth and um, now have thyroid nodules, which will have to be watched. An endocrinologist said that it, you know, could, I could um, contract thyroid cancer. Around the same time June Casey lost her hair, Tom Bailey was a toddler. For years, he drank the milk and ate the food on his family's farm, which was located right next to the Hanford reactors. Well, growing up here downwind from Hanford, it never meant anything to us because it was a neighbor and our business was to grow food and their business was to make nuclear weapons. And we never paid any attention to what they did. We never looked over the fence. We always had deformed farm animals. The biggest amount of deformed animals uh, was 80 calves out of 200 cows were grossly deformed. Either they died or they were too deformed to walk. We had deformed sheep, deformed kittens, deformed chickens. In some years, there were a lot of them. Some years, there weren't so many. In the mid-1980s, Tom Bailey began to wonder, if the animals on the farms were so affected, what about the people? He himself was born with birth defects, and today is sterile. He surveyed the 28 families who lived in a small area near Hanford and found that 27 of them had suffered severe health problems, all of which are associated with exposure to high doses of radiation. This area is now known as the Death Mile. This is the north corner of it here, beginning with the Weinberger household. The 1973 March Times poster child was born there with no eyes and blind. The family back in behind here, the boy that lives there, him and his wife just had a child with no skull and his father. June Casey and the residents of Death Mile are not alone. Thousands of people who lived in the northwestern United States have experienced similar devastating health problems. As the medical histories of Hanford downwinders began to come to light, the government was forced to begin revealing some of the classified documents about what had really been going on at Hanford. 
a picture has begun to emerge of enormous radioactive releases, some accidental and many intentional, into the air, the ground, and the Columbia River, which runs right through the Hanford complex. Releases that GE knew about at the time, but chose to cover up. We took, here in eastern Washington, the downwind area, twice the amount that the children at Chernobyl took. And at Chernobyl, they impounded all the milk, they evacuated whole towns, they cordoned off hundreds of miles of farmland. They evacuated their people, and they warned them. And here, there was absolutely no warning. They didn't evacuate anybody. Quite the contrary, they came and said, you're safe. One of the worst incidents during GE's tenure at Hanford was a calculated experiment in which radioactive particles containing more than 500 times the radiation of the Three Mile Island accident were deliberately released into the air. The documents explaining why this experiment was done are still classified. Well, it was on Mother's Day of 1986 when I read an article in my local newspaper describing this release, a deliberate secret experiment by the GE Hanford plant um, in 1949 when I was a student at Whitman College. And I just knew immediately, it was like a knife in my heart. I said to myself, oh no. And I really was in tears all day. I knew immediately what had happened to me then was related to that secret experiment. The toxic and radioactive legacy left behind at Hanford is staggering. There are at least 1,100 contaminated sites on the grounds. The Columbia River, a source of food and place of recreation for people throughout the Northwest, is now the most radioactive river in the world. Two-thirds of the high-level waste from U.S. weapons production is stored at Hanford in tanks that leak and, as some scientists have warned, could explode. Cleaning up these environmental disasters is expected to cost at least $60 billion and take over 30 years, with General Electric leaving its share of the tab to the U.S. taxpayers. Thousands of downwinders are now suing for damages. The government has begun to acknowledge its role in the devastation at Hanford. So far, General Electric has not. All they've ever said in their letters to me is that we left all the documents behind, and so we don't know anything more than you do or what you read in the newspapers. And I guess I find that very hard to believe. Sunday Today is brought to you in part by GE. From plastics to financial services, we bring good things to life. According to the business press, General Electric is the most powerful company in the United States, and GE is rapidly expanding its control of markets worldwide. From NBC News, GE owns NBC, Hotpoint, and RCA, and in its annual report, boasts of its leadership role in each of the products it manufactures. But the one product line it never mentions is nuclear weapons, where GE has also been an industry leader. Continuing in the role it carved out at Hanford, today GE makes critical components for more nuclear weapons systems than any other company. And the trail of radioactive and toxic waste GE is leaving behind at research and production sites across the U.S. also continues to grow and grow. GE builds the neutron trigger for every U.S. hydrogen bomb, is a prime contractor for Star Wars and the new radioactive space reactor, the SP-100, a moving force behind the deadly Trident submarine and missile, the B-1 and B-2 bombers, the MX, Minuteman and cruise missiles, the F-111, and the list goes on and on. We have about 30,000 nuclear weapons, far more than enough to defend ourselves. But industry exerts a lot of influence on whether or not we buy weapons. And General Electric is one of our foremost defense contractors. The American public ought to become aware of the fact that it is these companies, like General Electric, that push the Congress into building more weapons than we need. Progress in the defense of our nation. And at General Electric, progress is our most important product. Until next week, then, good night for General Electric.
In the beginning of the atomic age, General Electric helped make the bombs that destroyed Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And today, GE continues to be a key player behind the scenes in determining federal nuclear weapons policy. Thanks to the company's high volume of PAC contributions, its 150-person Washington lobbying office, the largest of any weapons contractor, and the revolving door between the military and GE's top executive offices, through which people like General David Jones, former chair of the Joint Chiefs of Staff under Reagan, have ended up serving on GE's board of directors. And GE's influence in Washington starts right at the top, among the handful of corporate CEOs who have direct access to President Bush is GE's Jack Welch. Today, one of GE's most lucrative contracts is for testing and building critical components for the Trident submarine. Much of this work is done at the Knowles Atomic Power Laboratories, a nuclear weapons complex located in upstate New York near Schenectady. There are close to 400 tons of lethal waste buried in dozens of secret landfill sites on the facility's grounds. Three of the five reactors in the Knowles complex were built without the containment structures or backup emergency core cooling systems found in all commercial nuclear reactors. Away. But as it did while running Hanford, General Electric insists that there is no danger at Knowles. In the four decades of operation, GE has stated, there has been no significant impact from Knoll site operations on the environment or adverse effects on the community or the public. In fact, GE claims it wants its workforce to alert management to health, safety, and environmental concerns. People are recognizing their voice means something. People from the union floor, people from everywhere, are given their ideas. Their, the people closest to the work know the work best. So the ideas are coming from them. We're responding. They're saying, geez, if I say something, those bozos up there listen to me. They act. They do something. And we're acting. And we're doing things with it. So that, as a result, but General Electric's doors were not open for Jack Shannon, the manager of nuclear criticality safety at the Kessel Ring site of the Knowles complex. After 30 years of devoted service, Shannon filed an inspection report that concluded that GE apparently had been falsifying records about how much asbestos Knowles workers had been exposed to. He also raised concerns about insufficient fire protection at the site's nuclear reactors and about GE's failure to set up an emergency evacuation plan for the surrounding community. Instead of addressing the problem Shannon raised, GE went after him. Within about a month after I published my inspection report at the Kesselring site, I was summarily removed from my management job. Subsequent to that, I was uh, again demoted several months later to performing uh, data entry work for, uh, in a nuclear reactor design organization an organization that I had left in about <clears throat> 1969 or 70. You really took a nosedive. Yeah, <laughs> took a nosedive. Here was a man who had uh, brilliant performance ratings, the highest you can get, exceptional, superior, uh, with comments by the general manager of the facility written directly onto his performance appraisals about what a golden-haired boy he was at the plant. Well, suddenly, he couldn't tie his shoes. This kind of uh, retaliation is fairly standard. And I think it has been going on for 40 or 50 years. Uh, when you find a problem, you don't correct the problem. You get rid of the guy who brought the problem to your attention. A week after my visit to the Schenectady area, uh, with the Knowles workers, GE issued a site-wide gag order forbidding all comment by Knowles employees about the plant. And uh, if you failed to live up to the directive, then you were facing, the gag order said, termination, a $100,000 fine, and life in prison. Despite the gag order, some workers have continued to speak out about the hazards of GE's nuclear weapons work at Knowles, particularly about the lack of protection workers there have from exposure to asbestos and other toxic and radioactive substances. Through the newspapers, we started compiling the list, 
And somewhere around by 1988, I was up to around 145 members that have died of one type of cancer or another. They virtually contaminated themselves with asbestos. Breathe it in. How much? Nobody knows. Part of the reason they don't know is because of a presidential order that exempts the Knowles facilities from standard health, safety, and environmental oversight regulations. By citing national security concerns, top executives at General Electric and the Department of Energy have seen to it that they are the only people who know the full extent of the dangers at Knowles. Why does all these autopsies show that the lungs are covered with asbestos fibers or these guys have had lungs removed because they were full of asbestos? In order to have that much asbestos, you had to exceed OSHA limits sometimes. But according to them, we never have. And, it, and it's been an ongoing battle between me and General Electric Company and how since 1986 to get asbestos cleaned up. And we're acting, and we're doing things with it. So that, as a result of that, they're willing to bring up more, more significant things. Their self-confidence is rising, and they're bringing up things that matter. So now I'd like to invite Jack Welch up to Knowles Atomic Power Lab. I'd like to have him meet some of the spouses of the employees that were employed there. The spouses that I had to talk to at the, at the wakes and the funerals. Let him visit them and explain to them why their husband's lungs were covered with asbestos or full, filled with asbestos. Why their husband's died of cancer related to the asbestos. I'd like to have him explain to them why it was their husband, instead of me trying to. Well, that stick on the right, he's just got a smile on his face. He always seemed to, to look on the positive side of things. For nine years, Don Cole's brother Dick worked at Knowles as a refueling engineer. A healthy man who didn't drink or smoke, Dick suddenly ended up in the hospital one summer with cancerous tumors throughout his body. His doctor asked him, uh, if there had been any exposure during his work at General Electric. He knew that there had been some internal exposure, that that had been documented, but he didn't have a copy of the document. And so he asked his manager if he would uh, prepare that document. The report was drawn, and it was at that point that Dick realized that something was terribly wrong because the indication was that there had been one exposure at one particular point in his work and he was aware of at least nine exposures. 31-year-old Dick Cole decided to try to set the record straight and protect the health of other nuclear weapons workers. In a 35-page affidavit, he documented each of the times he had been exposed to radiation, as well as GE's failure to properly monitor or record those exposures. They were trying to measure the degree of hazard, but the, the measurement devices were inadequate. The film badges and the personal pocket decimeters that they were wearing on their left shoulders uh, were not reading the, the scanning the whole bodies. They weren't uh, required to wear respiratory materials masks. Uh, none of that happened. So he was always at risk in some way or another. Um, they didn't mark some of the areas where the radioactive contamination was, and uh, on occasion, he walked into these areas, not knowing because there were no signs. Shortly before Dick died, I got this in the mail. My dearest brother, this week I wrote letters to both the kids telling them that I am dying and that I love them. I think that was the hardest thing I ever had to do in my life. I have been in pain now for nearly a year, and the thought of not being with them much longer tears at my heart whenever I look at them. I bear no ill will to anyone at Knowles. I think I have made some fine friends there. I do think that it is through GE's negligent policies that I was unnecessarily exposed to internal and external doses of radiation of unknown quantities, and that this is why I am now dying of cancer. Take care. I love you very much, Dick. <laughs> <laughs> you 
and that's what he said. Wherever there's a glow warmer than you know, we'll be there. Dick issued the affidavits, um, then died, and once he died, the investigation stopped. It was as though, to General Electric, this never happened. We have a total commitment to make every person in the co co company envi an envi environmentalist. We are painting and lighting all factories to new standards so people feel they're in a very clean atmosphere and it gives them another sense of the environment. And we have Despite its public relations campaign, GE has yet to take responsibility for the problems caused by its involvement in the nuclear weapons industry, choosing instead to keep making more commercials about the technology behind GE products. All our science, our technology, our mathematics. Somehow they add up to moments beyond any calculation. But all the life-affirming ads money can buy can't undo the environmental and health damage General Electric has caused. Not only in its nuclear weapons work, but in the manufacture of other products as well. GE has the largest number of Superfund toxic dump sites in the U.S and according to EPA data, releases more cancer-causing chemicals than any other corporation. The health problems and birth defects caused by General Electric's commitment to the environment are impossible to quantify. Somehow they add up to moments beyond any calculation. General Electric is in this business of building weapons for profit, not for patriotism, not for the country, not for the flag, but for profit. And the American public, if they want to change General Electric's attitude on building weapons, the only thing we can do is stop buying their other, other products like refrigerators and light bulbs. Can you take a second to help stop nuclear weapons? We just need your signature right over here. Okay. Great. It makes a big difference. We're at the ironing board. Four million individuals and 450 organizations in the U.S., Canada, and around the world have decided to join the GE Boycott, a grassroots campaign to force General Electric to stop producing nuclear weapons and take responsibility for the damage it has caused. The campaign, which has already cost GE hundreds of millions of dollars, is run by InFact, the group that forced Nestle, the world's largest food corporation, to change its unethical marketing practices of infant formula. One of the major strategies of Infact's campaign to stop the production and promotion of nuclear weapons is to focus on the industry leader, and that's GE. When GE pulls out of the nuclear weapons business, that'll be a signal to all of the other companies that nuclear weapons is a business that nobody wants to or can afford to be in. One of the retailers that has joined Infact's campaign is a Midwestern chain of more four supermarkets. More four stores stopped carrying GE products after co-owner Greg Erickson got fed up with GE's television commercials. We are threads in the invisible tapestry. People helping people. And GE is part of everything we do. So that what GE does is not bring good things to life. They, they mislead the American public. They pollute the earth. They dump toxic waste. They irradiate their workers. And they are one of the largest producers of nuclear weapons in the world. I find their ads disgusting. I find that ad disgusting. Our distributor requested a meeting to discuss our decision to terminate selling GE bulbs. GE sent their consumer affairs uh, director, Ford Slater. The conversation drifted along the lines of economic sweetheart deals. And after listening to this for about 20 or 25 minutes, I just leaned in and told Mr. Slater that there was no way that our company was selling General Electric bulbs, even if they gave them to us for free. In addition to the retail boycott, Infact is having its most dramatic success with GE's sales of medical equipment. Scores of religious and healthcare organizations in many countries are now participating in the campaign. We found an innate contradiction between GE, on the one hand, uh, developing the technology we're using in healthcare to enhance life, and on the other hand, uh, marketing and uh, producing 
equipment that was geared to destroying life. What we're doing is we're directing our people to look at purchasing uh, equipment other than GE equipment whenever possible. We've uh, been able to purchase an MRI unit from a company other than GE that uh, cost approximately $1.3 million. We've also purchased a CAT scanner uh, for $1.2 million, and we're in the process of purchasing some angiography equipment that will probably cost between three dollars and $400,000. You're talking about an impact that's, that's big bucks on GE. Over one-third of the health care institutions in the United States are sponsored by religious congregations. And it seems to me if we could get the congregations involved in this campaign, we could have a tremendous impact on GE. And in fact, I think we're already having an, an impact on GE. Since this campaign began, GE has quadrupled the amount of money they spend on image advertising. You know, those warm and fuzzy TV ads. GE is now flying high-level corporate executives all over the country to meet with major purchasers of GE products, trying to convince them not to be a part of this boycott. And most significantly, GE is finally starting to move out of the nuclear weapons business. Since we launched the boycott in 1986, GE's nuclear weapons work has decreased 28 percent. And in the fall of 1990, a major, major campaign victory. GE publicly announced that it's not going to make the neutron triggers for nuclear bombs anymore. That's one of the first things that we asked GE to do when we started this campaign. So this isn't a symbolic effort. We're in this to win. We let them know that we're leaving these radioactive barrels of waste here as um, symbols of what GE has been poisoning the environment with. And he said that he didn't want to accept them. Um, and somebody here, one of, the, one of the protesters here said, are you asking us to clean up your toxic waste again? <laughs> so, so we're going to leave these here. Together, helping each other will keep us growing strong. We go hand in hand, you and me. We are threads in the invisible tapestry. Because of the fact that GE owns NBC, we do not see many of these um, facts presented in the mainstream news. And so it's up to us in a, our networking to get this information out. It seems to me that we have enough of these devices to make war. I think it's about time we started thinking about devices to make peace. <laughs>